So, good afternoon. It's great to be here in Regina. You know, in my job, I get to work with leaders of health systems all over the world. So, I mean, I feel um, um, quite well qualified, I think, to be able to, to say some things about what's happening um, here in Saskatchewan. And I'd, I'd honestly say that what you're doing is globally significant. I think it's, um, it's ambitious, it's creative, um, and I think the eyes of the world um, are on you. And at the end of my talk, I maybe want to say something about my reflections on, uh, on each, of, each of my visits. And, um, you know, this time I get a real sense of, of progress, and uh, I look forward to my next visit. So, our theme today is about building and aligning energy for change. And I'd say if we look at the evidence about large-scale change, how do we change a whole system? You know, how do we create system, um, changes that, that impact and create improvements for every single patient in the province? That actually focusing on energy for change is, is a very um, helpful way of thinking about things. So, let's start off with some data, and it's some data from McKinsey, so it's got to be right. <laughs> the reality is that most big change doesn't achieve its objectives. So, if we were looking at the lean transformation um, program that's going on at the moment across Saskatchewan, and we were to say, what are the odds Okay, based on other large-scale change efforts. And we'd actually say, where we stand at the moment, the odds aren't that good. Okay? So, if we look at this data, what it basically says is that only about 25% of large-scale change initiatives okay, get anywhere near to achieving their objectives. So, that little orange segment there. Okay? And furthermore, only about 5% of big, large-scale, transformational um, change programs get to a stage where they actually achieve their objectives, the objectives are sustained, and we then go on and make even more change. So I guess for all of us here, as members of the Saskatchewan health community, the big question is, what do we need to do in terms of our transformation effort to make sure that we are at least in that 25% group, and ideally in the little green 5% segment. So what I'd like to do today is to, um, is to humbly share some ideas around what, what might help to make that happen, or some things to think about. So, the, the methodology, the philosophy that we've chosen as our vehicle for, for transformational change is lean. If we look at the evidence base, at the published research about lean efforts, what it tells us is actually that the same factors that apply in other large-scale change efforts apply in lean transformation. Okay? So actually, if we take evidence from um, other large-scale change efforts, it may be very helpful for thinking about what do we need to do to make sure that we deliver our very ambitious goals for our patients and our population. So, why is energy so important when it comes to thinking about large-scale change? What the evidence tells us is that the thing that we most want to happen, i.e. that we um, deliver lots of change and lots of different levels of the system, and we're able to sustain it, the thing that we most want to happen is the thing that is least likely to happen. Okay? And it's number three in, uh, in order of, of frequency. The thing that is most likely to happen is that we work very hard, you know, pushing the change forward. We get so far, and then it runs out of energy. It simply fades away. So our question, or, or our issue, as leaders of large-scale change is, what do we need to do to really um, build and sustain energy for change for the long haul? So, some ideas. If we look at the evidence around large-scale change, what it tells us is, if we want to create and deliver that big change, 
we need to think about intrinsic motivators. If you like, these are the things, the factors that um, you know, when we think about um, our workforce, our communities, our patients, connecting with values, connecting with the things in our hearts that are important to us, the things that create energy and, and creativity. So we're talking here about connecting to a shared purpose, like why are we doing this change? Why is it Im important to us? Why does it engage us? How do we engage and mobilise people for change? You know, our leadership, our workforce, our patients, our communities. How do we build motivational leadership? Okay. Very, very important in terms of large-scale change. But we also know that intrinsic motivators aren't enough. Okay. What often happens is that, that where um, systems or organisations have tried to create large-scale change, largely through intrinsic motivators, what you end up is with is lots of little projects all over the place, with lots of highly motivated, passionate people making changes. But all those little changes don't add up to change across the whole system. And actually, what we want is a situation where every person in Saskatchewan will get great care. Okay? And so just focusing on intrinsic motivators isn't enough. And we'd call it a thousand flowers blooming, you know, lots of little changes all over the place. So what we also need are, are the things that drive extrinsic motivation, if you like, the, the mechanisms and the things that we put into the system that give us focus and momentum to delivery and, and move us all in the same direction. And these are things like you know, um, incentive systems, payment by results, payment for quality, performance management systems, how we measure to hold people to account. And again, the evidence tells us very, very clearly that when we're thinking about our large-scale change efforts, we need both, okay? And we need to be able to hold the tension between intrinsic and extrinsic in tension with each other. What's the reality of the relationship between those two things, okay? Which one tends to dominate? What's your experience? Extrinsic, yeah. Okay. This is what we see happening time and time again. Certainly this is what happens in my system in the National Health Service in England. Okay. Because we're trying to think about how can we change the whole organisation or the whole system, we put lots of these extrinsic you know, targets and payment systems and holding to account in. And what it ends up doing is killing off the energy and the creativity. And so we've, we have to find ways, if we're going to create and sustain change across the whole system, to be able to work with both. This is a quote from, I think, a really inspirational Australian leader of transformational change called Peter Fuda. And we're actually going to watch a little film from Peter Fuda shortly. And he says, you know, transformation is not a matter of intent. So here in Saskatchewan, we've got a fantastic transformational intent. We've got really big goals, big ambitions for our patients and the kind of services we want them to have. But it isn't enough, you know. Um, if we're going to create really um, uh, systemic change, we need to align things. We need to join things up. That's why in the National Health Service in England, we've created what we call a model for change. In a sense, we've looked at um, all the big changes that we've, uh, uh, we've attempted to make over the last 10 or 15 years, and we've synthesized out of that, or pulled out of that, the factors that seem to make the biggest difference. Okay? And what we do now is we use that for, as a lens for thinking about change. So I'll, um, I'll show you this model, and I hope you can see it at the back. So, these are eight factors, based on evidence, that we should be thinking about in terms of large-scale change. And I think, you know, when we, um, uh, when we talk about our big change efforts here, okay, it's a very useful lens for saying, are all of these eight factors present? So right at the heart of this is, is building shared purpose, okay? If we don't sit down, and engage everybody who's part of the change and is impacted
impacted by the change at the beginning with creating a shared purpose for the change, then what we're trying to do is to, is to build change on sand. Okay? Very, very important we build shared purpose. The next one, um, or there's a whole series of them that are about intrinsic motivators for change. Okay? So how we engage um, uh, to mobilize, you know, how we get people really involved in the change, how we build motivational leadership for change. A series of these factors are about the extrinsic factors. So we have you know, system drivers, the, 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 the payment systems, the incentive systems to underpin the change. We have transparent measurements. So you know, not only are we measuring effectively, but we're making the, the measures public. Okay? So that our patients can see um, what the outcomes are um, between different parts of our health system. And, um, you know, and, and in a sense, we can use that transparency to improve. The third part of this that is about extrinsic factors is, is rigorous delivery. And it's about having really effective program and uh, performance management systems. In addition, there's two other aspects. Okay. The first is in, around improvement methodology and improvement philosophy, which I think is something that is very, very strong here. Okay. The evidence is very clear. Organizations and systems that adopt a specific evidence-based improvement methodology and stick with that over a period of time will get better outcomes of change. Okay. Then finally, we focus on spread of innovation. And what this means is you know, when we're trying to, for instance, in one part of the province, um, create a system that we provide better care for frail older people, before we even start making change, we think about where this is going to go next and the place after and the place after. So we're, we're really thinking about, um, about spread right from the start. And if you like, the idea of this is to look at our change efforts and to say, are we utilizing or are we thinking about all eight components? And even more importantly, are they all lined up and joined up with each other? Okay, I'm going to give you like a little conversation on your table now. Looking at those eight components, okay, say hello to the other people on your table. I hope you can all see them okay. And talk about which one appeals to you the most. Okay, which one do you feel most attracted to? Okay, so um, just have a conversation for, uh, for, for two or three minutes. So let's get an idea of some of the preferences that we have in the room. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to commit to just one, okay? In terms of um, which one do you feel connected with or attracted to the most? How many of you pick shared purpose? Okay, there's a f few, about a quarter of the room. Who picked engage to mobilize? Oh, there's a few engagers, great. How many of you pick leadership for change? Okay, good, lots of leaders. How about spread of innovation? There's a, yeah, it's a good spread of innovators, that's great. Who picked improvement methodology? Hmm. Not too many, but very important people because we need lots of method. How about rigorous delivery? Okay, yeah, again, a sprinkling. How about transparent measurement? Where's our measurers? Okay, a few more measurers. And how about system drivers? Who picks system drivers? Okay. Okay. So what that would say to me is that in terms of who we have in this room, um, we're probably much more focused on the intrinsic side, okay, and um, you know making the connection with values than maybe we are on the on the extrinsic. And why it's useful to use this model and you know to think about preferences is because what we want to do when we're creating change is that we want to, to build teams where people. Um, come with different strengths and, and, and very, very um, different perspectives on things. So, you know, it's, it's useful doing this at the beginning of a change project and say, you know, um, where are our strengths as a team? You know, who likes to do what? We've um, worked retrospectively with over 100 teams in the NHS now to apply this model as a lens on change projects that are actually quite mature. And what we've done with teams has, has been to say, which of these components, if you had your time again, would you have spent more time on? OK, 
Okay. And one of them stands out absolutely loud and clear. Which is the one that you think people say, I wish we'd spent more time on that, knowing what we know now? Shared purpose, yeah. What we have a tendency to do is, you know, we get very enthusiastic and positive about our change processes. So we think we're going to redesign a new pathway of care for people with dementia and their families. And we rush straight into action. And what we don't spend enough time doing is, is kind of standing back and think, you know, what are we actually trying to achieve here? Why are we doing this change? You see, if people don't understand the why, it's very hard to get them doing the what. More about that later. So we work um, with this approach in lots of different ways. And, and one thing we do is that we, um, we ask teams to evaluate where they are by each of the eight components. And one of the things we do, we, we use these, which are called spider diagrams. And we ask team members to assess on a score um, here between one and 10, how strong do you think we are on each of the components? Okay? And we get people to do it individually and look at the range, and then we do as an assessment as a team. Interestingly, people that are senior in organizations tend to give much higher scores than people that are at the point of care. Um, what do you think of this project here, which is about radically redesigning an asthma pathway? Do you think this team will do well in its change efforts? What do you think? Okay, who thinks that they'll, they'll do really well? Who thinks it's, um, it's questionable? Yeah, I think it's questionable. I think this team um, will definitely deliver, but it might not be the right thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of great to, um, to view things in this way. So, so this particular team, you know, they've got a really strong program management team, and the leadership is very is well engaged. But they're not thinking about some of the other incentives and system drivers in the system that they can use to push it in the right direction. They're not really measuring. And I'd say one of the biggest problems is that they haven't built a shared purpose and sought to engage and mobilize people. So, you know, think you know, um, in terms of your change processes. This is a model that you might want to use, okay, to just stand back and say, how are we doing against each of these eight components? And are they aligned with each other? Now, one of the things about working in this way is that when we think about the aspects of change that are about extrinsic, okay, they're, they're things, they're tangible, we can see them, we can measure them. You know, we can, we can see an incentive system or a measurement system or a, rig, or a rigorous delivery system. And we've also got a language that already exists for those things. But when it comes to the more intrinsic aspects, like shared purpose and engage and mobilize, you know, they're, they're much more kind of ethereal, they're, they're harder to pin down, and also we don't have a common language. So, what we did in the NHS in England was to do a lot of analysis around can we create a, a set of ideas or a way of thinking or change methods that will really help us um, with this side of things. And what we decided to do was to focus on energy for change. Okay. And the reason why we decided to do this is because there's such a strong body of evidence that says that organizations and systems that think very deliberately um, about energy will tend to do better in their change processes. So, so let's think about energy, okay, and energy for change. Do we think like frightening people, okay, putting a bit of fear into the system? Do you think that that creates energy and, uh, and, and, uh, and moves people towards change? Let's have a little vote, okay? Who thinks that mostly, in most circumstances, injecting a bit of fear motivates people to change versus who thinks that mostly, okay, building in fear inhibits people from change? So first of all, put your hand up if you think that mostly a bit of fear in the system motivates change. Okay, it's a few of us, good. I reckon about a quarter. Who thinks that fear inhibits? OK, 
Okay, most of us. Right. And what I want to do now, I want to show you a little film about energy for change. And this comes from, from Peter Fuda, who I talked about. And what this is about, this film, is, is Peter Fuda's experience of working with seven chief executives. These were chief executives of private companies okay, who wanted to um, deliver transformational change in their organizations. So we're going to watch this and we're going to think about some questions afterwards. So here we go. So let's talk about the fire metaphor. So the first question I ask these seven CEOs is why? Why do you actually want to undertake this transformation journey? Initially they said things like, I can see big storm clouds on the horizon, or our financial trajectory is poor, or our competitors are more aggressive, our customers are squeezing us, our staff engagement is at an all-time low. Over time, they began to talk about more personal reasons for beginning their journey, things like one CEO said, my reputation is on the line, I'm afraid I will look really stupid if I can't build a company of substance. Another said, I'm physically exhausted, I can't keep going like this. And another still said, every day I try a different approach, but nothing seems to work. I'm starting to feel like an imposter. So it struck me that all these responses centered around a fear-based motivation for change, or what is often termed a burning platform. Now this metaphor of a burning platform has been around for a couple of decades, and it comes from a story about a man who is working on an oil platform out in the North Sea. So this guy is awoken one night by a large explosion. He runs up on deck and sees that the platform he is on is actually on fire. So he has a choice. Does he stay on the platform and burn to death, or does he jump 150 feet into freezing cold water and hope that he survives? He makes the decision to jump. Somehow manages to survive the impact and is eventually picked up by a rescue boat just before he freezes to death. When asked why he jumped, he replies, better probable death than certain death. So in a business context, this implies that fear and extreme urgency are not only necessary, but desirable motivators for change. In other words, in order to transform, we all need to run around with our ass on fire. Now as it turns out, in the land of burning platforms, there are far too many pyromaniacs. What I actually found was that while some urgency helped motivate the CEOs to begin their journey, a fear-driven motivation was not what sustained them over time. What they all spoke passionately about was a burning ambition, a very personal fire that burned within. They spoke about things like fulfilling their leadership potential and redefining their definition of success to include balance and a deeply held desire to live a big and authentic life. This personal burning ambition then transcended into a burning ambition for their organisations as well. One CEO not only wanted to transform the culture of his company in Australia, but to affect positive change in the corporate parent company globally. This resulted in him making decisions locally, knowing that he was placing himself in the firing line. Another CEO's ambition for a big and authentic life encouraged him to connect the creative energy of his advertising agency to worthy social causes. This ultimately manifested itself in one of the largest social movements any of us have seen in recent years, that of Earth Hour. So what I've learned through all of this is three things. The first is that to sustain a transformation journey, shifting from a burning platform to a burning ambition is absolutely critical. Why? Because this shift allows leaders to be calmer, more purposeful and more responsive to the inevitable challenges that they're going to face. Secondly, it's also vital for a leader to not only articulate the organisational reasons for change, but to delve deeper and establish very compelling personal motivations for change. Finally, the fire, or the big why, is actually a crucial part of how leaders transform. As Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. And this is why I place the fire at the centre of our seven metaphors. Because if the fire goes out, all other factors are redundant. Peter Fuda's three lessons for transformational change. Let's think about those in the context here in Saskatchewan and our ambition. In order to sustain transformational change, we as leaders need to move from a burning platform, which he defines as fear-based urgency, to a burning ambition, a shared purpose for a better future. So, you know, what we should think about is, you know, to what extent are we really articulating, getting across our burning ambition in terms of um, transforming healthcare here in Saskatchewan? Secondly, we as leaders need to be able to articulate personal reasons for change as well as organisational reasons. Okay? 
The evidence around this is very, very clear. That if we want to influence people to get involved in change, okay, if we want to call them to action, then we need to make a connection at the level of emotions through values. Okay? And that means that we need to be telling personal stories. Because if we want people to get involved in our change, we need to talk about our own experiences, tell our own stories, so um, people can, can hear our values. And through hearing our values, are much more likely to get involved in change. And then finally, if the fire, the compelling reason, the why, the sense of shared purpose, if that goes out, okay, the energy goes. All other factors are redundant. So, what I thought we'd do is we'd kind of have a little practice of this. So, I want you to talk to the person next to you. I'm going to give you one minute each, okay? What's my burning ambition for my service, my community, uh, my patients, and my family, at whatever level you want to connect it, and try to make it personal, okay? Tell the other person why this, amb this ambition connects to your own personal motivation. So, have some conversations, and the, the first person, start telling your story now. I'm going to move us on. I get a real sense of lots of energy in the room, and what's happening is people want to go on talking, and that's what happens when we tell stories, because we start to connect with each other. So, let's carry on with this energy theme. I took this quote from Bob Nelson. I like this quote. He says, you get the best efforts from others, not by lighting a fire, beneath them, but by building the fire within. I think we need to put a lot more effort, generally, as leaders of change, into building fires within. But I also think we do need a bit of fire beneath as well. So I think we probably, um, we probably need both. So we've been getting very serious in the NHS in England um, with regard to our transformational change efforts you know, in terms of thinking about energy for change. So what we did was that we commissioned York Health Economics Consortium and Landmark to do some work for us around energy for change. And the first thing was, you know, what difference does a focus on energy make? And across the board, you know, from a, from a number of different sources, there were um, significant reports around the, the, you know, focusing on energy, um, the extent to which it helps um, change processes um, to deliver results, and, and particularly to sustain them. But um, what our research partners also did was to develop a framework to help us to think about energy in our change work. So what I'd like to do now is just show you a little film that talks about the energies that we've developed. And obviously, this is written for the NHS in England. So, like, like in your mind, when you watch this, like, turn it away from the NHS and, you know, make it Saskatchewan, okay? Let's uh, roll the film. Change is energy. Energy is change. Both are fundamental to everything. The universe, some physicists say, exists because of a quantum change that occurred over 13 billion years ago. And the energy the Big Bang released drives every part of our vast universe. Change generates energy, and energy drives change. We live in a constant flow of both. Everything changes. Life is eternal flux. That's good. Change is a positive force. Harnessed properly, it helps us build on the success of the past so that the future is better and life improves for us all. The trick is to harness the energy that drives change and that change generates. And change generates an immense amount of energy. 
It's what underpins everything we do. In the NHS, change is a constant. We work in such a big, diverse and dynamic organisation, dealing with millions of people who rely on us to make their lives better. And the only way we can do it successfully is to focus the power of change so it makes a real difference. That takes energy, positive energy, from lots of people, united by a common goal to keep our population healthy. As an NHS system, we're always trying to drive change. But there's a problem. Many of the projects we start, we don't finish or get to our final goals. We run out of energy, which means that sometimes important changes don't happen when they're needed most or happen in a few isolated areas and they aren't sustained over time. That affects us. It affects the whole NHS and ultimately the patients and people who rely on us. To make change successful, we need to align our energies externally to create a powerful force for change. We also need to manage our own energies internally as a leader. All five energies are vital. They're what make us human. They make everything happen. They energize change. We need to be honest. Right now, we're not always in balance. Often the energy isn't flowing properly. The momentum for change falters and it's easy for people to get fearful and lose hope. Feelings which can be contagious and lead to projects grinding to a halt. And if we overemphasize on any one energy, we get an imbalance. That's why it's important we work together to bring all energies into balance and harness and direct them towards achieving our goals and objectives so that the majority of our projects achieve our goals for patients and the public. That will help us to deliver the change that's urgently needed. And that takes leadership. Leaders know how to balance the energies of their people, as well as themselves. And of course, it's important to know your own energy and how you manage it. To recognise when things are out of kilter and then act decisively to balance them. When things change for the better, it's a great feeling. You feel like you've really done something important, something that has an impact on the people we serve, the entire NHS, your team and yourself. This unstoppable flow of change can't be halted, so it's better to make it positive rather than negative. And that takes all our energies. We've developed a range of tools to help you harness energy for change. All you have to do is use them. Great. So, let's, uh, let's do some thinking about energy. Just want to take you through those five energies again. And what I want you to think about is in your own setting, you know, the organisations that you're working in or with, um, you know, which of the energies are, are most prevalent. So, you know, these are, these are my definitions, okay? So, the first one, social energy. This is the energy that is about alignment, partnership, you know, working together. Where we have strong social energy, we have a sense of us and us rather than us and them. And you know, so many of the things that we're talking about at the moment, you know, new kinds of care partnerships, okay, partnerships between patients and providers, integrated care needs strong social energy. The second kind of energy is spiritual energy. And this is the energy of hope and possibility it's the sense of a different future that we all aspire to. And where spiritual energy is high, it's easier for people to take that step, feel more confident about taking that step towards a different future. The third energy is, is psychological energy. And it's like the bedrock, it's the foundation of all the other energies. And it's the energy that, that is around me as an individual. And it's the extent to which I feel psychologically safe to innovate and take part in change. It's the extent to which I feel resilient. I trust the people around me to create change. The fourth energy is physical energy. 
It's the energy of implementation action, making things happen and getting them done. And the fourth, the, so the fifth energy is intellectual energy. And this is the energy of thinking, planning. Um, you know, it's the, the kind of energy that we use when we pull together our transformation plans on a, on a big scale and think through in a very rational way what needs to happen where, which processes do we need to change, how are we going to reorganize our structures. And we can tell in our organizations when energies are high and low. So, in terms of social energy, okay, where it's low, you know, people feel very isolated, very alone, okay, out on the edge. Where social energy is high, we have a strong sense of solidarity. You know, we're in this together, we can do this together. When spiritual energy is low, as an individual, I feel very uncommitted. So my organization you know, has set its, its vision and its mission, and it's moving in a certain direction, but I don't feel very committed to that. I don't connect with it. Yet when spiritual energy is high, there's a real sense that you know, the work we're doing, we're doing it for very profound, value-driven reasons. We have, a, we have a higher purpose, which creates tremendous energy for transformational change. When psychological energy is low, you know, things feel kind of risky and, um, you know, bit too, you know, don't want to put my head above the parapet. You know, I'm not going to innovate. I'm not going to do things differently. I'm going to batten down the hatches. Whereas when psychological energy is high, I feel safe to try new ways of working, to do new things. When physical energy is low, you know, we have, we have a sense of fatigue. You know, we talk about, um, you know, um, change fatigue. You know, burnout, low physical energy. When physical energy is high, we have a real sense of vitality. And finally, intellectual energy. When intellectual energy is low, we make really stupid decisions. Like, you know, why the hell are we doing that? You know, like really illogical decisions. Yet, when intellectual energy is high, we work with really, really great reason and, you know, really think things through very well. Just going to give you a couple of minutes on your table. You know, in terms of where you are, the changes that you're involved in, and the teams that you're involved in, looking at the highs and lows of the energies, where do you think your team is? I'm going to move us on. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples where we've worked with um, different teams from, from my system in the NHS in England and the kind of scores around the, um, the energies uh, that, we've been, um, that we've been exhibiting. And that's the warm-up act, because what we're then going to do is to look at what we've learned so far about energy for change in Saskatchewan. So, so what we do, we've got an online tool and a, a number of you have filled this in already. How many of you filled in the Energy for Change Index? 43 of you have, so that's great. So what I hope is going to happen okay, at the end of the, the Quality Summit is that you're going to be so inspired by this, everybody else, that you're going to fill it in as well. And we're going to be able to get you know, a real good assessment of where Energy for Change is um, in, in, in Saskatchewan. So, what this, one of the things this does is it gives us a profile okay, around energy for change. And it says, you know, where are we as a team or an organization, or in our case, as a whole system, where's our energy for change at the moment? You know, are some energy of the five domains more dominant than others? What's our optimal domain? And you know, what, would it, what would it look like? So what we do, what it gives us, it's like the spider diagram. If the energy on that particular domain is low, then the, the mark is towards the middle. And if it's high, it's out towards the end. Okay, let's have a look at a couple of NHS teams. Okay? This profile here is very typically uh, from a hospital system in England, and it's to do with its transformation efforts on cost and quality. Okay? Have a look at that for a minute. Maybe talk. What do you, you think is happening there? Okay, in terms of their energy, and what do we ought to do about it? 
Just have a look at that and maybe talk to people around you. Okay, let me show you my assessment. What's good about this team is that we have an environment here where we've clearly harnessed the energy of the people and there's a momentum for change, okay? Because there's high intellectual and high physical energy. However, we've failed to engage people fully because social energy um, is low. And this, um, this imbalance creates a situation where people feel uncertain about how they can contribute and therefore a sense of risk. So what we see there is that psychological um, energy is, sh is, is low and a lack of hope for the future, hence spiritual energy is low. However, the good thing is that we can build energy for this team and help them to get better outcomes for their change efforts by building the solidarity of the team and also by developing a shared purpose. This focus, okay, this kind of profile, high physical energy and high intellectual energy, we see very, very much um, in our system. And you know when people talk about change fatigue and change burnout, it's typically this kind of profile. Okay? Let's look at a different one now. This, is, this one is from a team in community services. Okay? What do you reckon about this one? I'll, uh, I'll show you my assessment. So what's good okay, about this energy profile is obviously very high social energy. This is a mature team that's worked together for a long time and they've got very strong um, connections. And you know, there's a real sense of coming together, solidarity of strong relationships. And that, those, that very strong um, social energy means it gives them enough hope for the future that they're not kind of thinking about spiritual energy. But the problem is that this um, energy is undirected, okay? So there's not a sense of, of shared purpose and spiritual energy because the rational argument and the shared purpose hasn't been agreed, hence low intellectual energy and, um, and low spiritual energy. But the reason why there's such strong um, psychological energy in this profile is because the social energy is, um, is so high. So there's, there's quite a lot, you know, that we can do, we can, um, we can do with this team, okay, to help build their shared purpose and their spiritual energy and also um, their intellectual energy. Right, let's talk about Saskatchewan. So obviously, this is a very small sample. And, you know, I think we can't draw conclusions from it yet, but I want to show you what the results are so far because they're actually quite interesting. And, you know, we really, really hope that when the link goes out again with the evaluation form, that, that more of you will fill it in so we get a bigger picture. And wouldn't it be great um, if enough of us fill it in that we can create a baseline of energy for this year and maybe next year with the next quality summit we can look at it again and see how our energy is different. I think it would be a really great thing to do. So what we did oh, uh, was we gave you two um, questionnaires to fill in online. The first one, it, this one, is a set of um, questions, okay? And what this enables us to do is to, is to kind of understand where your energy is at the moment against the five domains. And the second part of the questionnaire uh, was like a self-evaluation, so we actually tell you what the energies are and ask you to do a, an assessment against that. So, of the 43 respondents so far, the first thing is that the energy for change is, is very high. So where we've been doing this assessment, you know, comparing it against our NHS database, okay, um, we've had energy ranges from 54% to 84%. And our um, energy here in Saskatchewan is 77%, so that's pretty much towards the top. Okay? And what's interesting is the two energies that are high our spiritual energy, okay, the energy of, you know, sense of, 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 of purpose, um, direction, um, and also intellectual energy, which is saying that actually our change is being um, well thought through. And what's interesting is that social energy, which is the energy of connectivity, OK, 
okay, looks lower at 72%. But we think this is skewed because it's, it's only a small sample with 43. And also, if you look at the minimum and maximum of social, there's one or two people who, f who feel that social energy is very low. Okay? And I think it's skewing the overall results. So we can check that out when, uh, when we get more people. Now, what we did was we did... You know, we asked people to complete two different questionnaires. One was the profiling data, which enabled us to work out you know, what is the current state of energy. And the second is the self-evaluation, where we gave the five energies to people and said, how are you doing against them? And what happened was, is that they are, they are very consistent. So basically, what you're showing on the profiling data, where, where you don't know what the energies are, is, is very consistent with the self-evaluation. Okay, which means that, that basically the people that took part in this um, showed very good self-awareness um, of, um, of their energy for change. The only area um, where there was a difference between the two was in physical energy, you know, the energy of action, making it happen, getting things done. Because we self-evaluated our physical energy at 70 but actually, when we did the actual profile that said, how is our energy at the moment, when we didn't know it was about physical energy, um, we had a much higher score at, um, at 76. So um, our physical energy is probably higher um, than we've, uh, we've rated. Now, this is the equivalent. You know when I showed you team A and team B in the spider diagram? This is the Saskatchewan um, equivalent of that. And what we've got here, can you see three different rings? Okay. The green ring is how I have evaluated my energy at the moment. The blue ring is the energy of the people I work with, where I think their energy is. And the red ring is how important this energy is. And what's important okay, is to look at the gaps between each of the rings um, you know, when it comes to the five energies. And if you, look at, um, if you look at the green and the red rings, what you can see is that when it comes to intellectual energy and spiritual energy, there's hardly any gap between the red and the green. Can you see that? But when it comes to physical energy and psychological energy, there's a big gap between the red and the, and the green. And what the group is basically saying is, we'd like to work on building our physical energy, energy of getting things, making things happen and getting things done, and our psychological energy, feeling safe about um, doing the change. What was very interesting about this group, or, or this profile, look at the blue ring in the middle. What people were saying consistently is, my own energy is much higher than the people I work with. Okay? We were measuring our own energy um, at one level, and measuring other people's energy at a much lower level. So I think it would be really good to have some conversations with each other about, um, about why we're thinking that. Now, this is really interesting to us. Okay? Um, one of the things we looked at is, is energy for change influenced by how distant we are from the chief exec? So if I'm somebody who's like a vice president or a chief exec, is my energy higher than if I'm somebody, you know, a frontline clinical worker? And is there a difference with regard to energy for change between clinicians and non-clinicians in Saskatchewan? And your results are different from those in the NHS, okay? Because our data set in the NHS says that um, consistently in our system, clinicians have higher energy um, for change than non-clinicians, okay? Particularly when it comes to spiritual energy, it's really marked in our system. So clinicians tend to have a much stronger kind of sense of the energy that is about purpose and direction than, than non-clinicians do. Okay? Um, and also higher levels of social energy. But um, in Saskatchewan, there weren't those differences. Okay? The non-clinicians had the same energy levels as the clinicians, although obviously it's a very small sample, and we want to see if that's true uh, with more people as well. Um, also, in the NHS, 
um, where people are nearer to the chief exec, so, so people that are more senior in the system, have higher levels of energy for change. Okay? Um, but what this showed is that in Saskatchewan, okay, there were no differences around um, levels of energy um, depending on how high you were in the system, apart from physical energy. So what conclusions do we make? The first conclusion is that we want to do this with more people. So really want you to fill this in after the, um, after the quality summit if you haven't. Okay? So the energy profile overall is 77%. Okay? But that varied widely across the different domain and across individuals. That based on this sample, it would be a good idea to focus on physical and psychological. And physical is about, you know, how do we um, create the opportunity for renewal? How do we make sure our workload's appropriate? Um, how do we create healthy work environments and, and healthy environments for, for undertaking change? And, psych and psychological energy is about how do we create the conditions where people feel safe, we build trusting relationships, and particularly we build leadership role models that show courage and trust in change. So it's early days with this, but I think it's got potential. Now, you know, when it comes to the change model, when it comes to the energy work, the really big focus um, is about shared purpose. And, you know, I think it would be one of my key messages um, to you to, to really be thinking about shared purpose. You know, it's much more than vision or mission. And I love this quote from Seth Carguilio, and he says that shared purpose is something that goes right into your gut and taps some part of your primal self. And he says, if we can bring people together with a similar primal purpose and we can get everybody marching in the same direction, then amazing things can be achieved. And think about what that might mean in the context of Saskatchewan. You know? How do we build this incredible sense of shared purpose for change that involves our patients, our community, our workforce, our leadership, you know? all marching in the same direction for change? Anybody know what that is? It's an air sandwich. Okay. Air sandwich is um, when you look at organizations and systems that do lean transformations, okay, air sandwich is a particular risk. Let me tell you about it. What happens is that we get the people at the top of the organization, the, the leadership, you know, involved in this change process, being accountable for the change goals. And we start to engage people at the front line of care and work with patients in different ways. And what we don't do is we don't focus you know, um, properly on the people in the middle. And they start to hear really like, ambiguous um, uh, messages because the people in the middle of the system, you know, the, the middle managers, have there been the people that have kind of made things happen, that have, taken the, um, that have taken the order and the direction, and have used lots of like, control mechanism and accountability to make people do things in different ways, you know? Um, um, I took this quote from Jay Derrigan, you know, history's taught us that the number one reason strategies fail is because of the way that we carry them out. You know, we put them into practice, we execute them. Unless we learn to engage people, not just people called executives, in a conversation about needs and wants and desires, we cannot expect to meet these needs. Okay? We can, um, not meeting those needs means we cannot expect people to even want to be engaged with us for whatever purpose. So, you know, let's not fall into the trap of connecting with our frontline um, teams and getting them involved in the change process and engaging our senior leaders without involving the people in the middle um, just as much. Okay. What do, one of the things that air sandwiches create is something called de facto purpose. And de facto purpose is a really big risk in lean transformations. Because as leaders, we're sending messages out to everybody else about what's important, okay? And if our messages are about, um, are about you know, things like improving processes, reducing costs, 
um, hitting targets, then our workforce, our staff, will hear that these are the most important things. And our shared purpose, you know, our big aspiration, our big purpose in, in transformational change can get displaced by a de facto purpose. And these are some examples here, you know, hitting the target, reducing the cost, reducing length of stay, eliminating waste and unwarranted variation, and so on and so on. So we need to be very explicit about de facto purpose. Anybody know what this is? No. It's a purpose obfuscation ometer. Okay. And this comes from a guy called um, Simon Guilfoyle. And Simon is a jobbing police inspector. He's a bobby. Okay. Um, in the NHS in England, and he's a wonderful system thinker. And what he says, what we keep doing across public service is that we keep putting our um, change processes through the purpose obfuscationometer. So at one end, we feed in our, um, the desire of our patient or our citizen and our bigger purpose. And what comes out the other end is the, is the de facto purpose. So he's from the police, so here's his first one. Okay? The citizen says, please catch the person who burgled my house. And what the machine hears is, we cannot afford another four point, we can only afford another 4.3 burglaries a day for the rest of the month, otherwise we'll miss the reduction target. Okay? And then in education, you know, the input, the true purpose. Okay? I want my child to learn. Okay? What comes out the other end, the de facto purpose? Schools should be ranked in league tables according to the proportion of students who, again, who attain exam grades A to C. I'm sure that never happens in Canada. Okay? And I'm sure it never happens in health. Okay? Here's one from the emergency room. Please help me to get better in my, um, at my time of, um, of acute illness. Okay? What comes out the other end? A 95 percentile of accident and emergency, emergency room patients must be admitted, discharged or transferred within four hours of arrival in this department. Okay? And, you know, we keep doing it. So one of my biggest messages to you is, you know, to think about, um, is to think about shared purpose. And if anybody thinks this isn't happening, I'll just show you an example um, from my system. So um, one of the things that I've got an absolute privilege to be engaged in at the moment is a, a learning program for young leaders, okay? young uh, GPs in training, young um, hospital doctors, young nurse managers, young general managers. And they're all on a six-month program learning to how to be great improvement leaders. And they all had to do this project um, uh, as part of this course that was, that was a key area of improvement for their organization. And I took these 100 projects from these 100 young leaders, and I gave them a score on a continuum. And if they, were, they were, had a low score, like one or two or three, they were mainly focused on quality, patient or experience. If they had a high score, like an eight or a nine or a ten, they were mainly focused on cost and efficiency and productivity. Look at that, you know. Um, what you can see there is that they were far, far more likely to be focused on cost and productivity and efficiency than they were on quality or safety or patient experience. Why is that happening? Because of de facto purpose. Because those young leaders are hearing from their, from, um, you know, their supervisors and their, their, um, their own managers that what's most important is cost and productivity. And yet, ironically, if they were to focus on quality, safety, experience and frame it in that way, they'd be far more likely to hit their goals around, um, around, around cost. So, coming to the end of my time, and I just wanted to reflect just quickly on my three visits to Saskatchewan. So the first time I came here was in 2008, and the only reason I came was because Pauline Rousseau from the ministry hounded me for about five years to come to Saskatchewan. So, so I came, and as soon as I came to Saskatchewan, um, what I realized was that this is a magic place, you know, with a great focus on improvement, really special. And what I saw when I first came, you know, were lots and lots of, of different initiatives. I talked about a thousand flowers blooming, you know, real focus on improvement, but it was kind of dotted all over the place. And the other thing I saw were lots of um, 
like, it sounds awful, really, like flowery messages about our aspirations for change. But what I didn't get a sense of were, um, were really clear goals that everyone could connect with. So one of the things that came out of, um, of the 2008 visit was I said, you know, we're doing this new thing in England called releasing time to care. You should do it. And, and I'm so kind of proud of what's happened since, and I'm so you know, thrilled at the way Saskatchewan has become a world leader okay, around releasing time to care and, um, uh, you know, and the difference that it's made to patients here. I, I think it's truly wonderful. So back I came again in 2010, and I was thrilled at how much progress you'd made and also that you'd listened to me. Um, and what I got a sense of was a real, like, intentionality of, of change. You know, we are very serious of change. However, what I saw then was a sense of, you know, we're, we're doing lots of a change and we've, our goals are better, but we haven't kind of made it mainstream. You know, we're not connecting this improvement enough with um, what, what teams do every day, the way we hold our, um, our leaders to account. So back I, here I am again now. And again, I mean, it's, it's incredible to be here, you know, to see what's being achieved, the really, um, the systematic way um, that, that you're going about change, you know, and, and um, I mean, I, don't, I know very few places in the world that have, um, you know, had such um, a strong focus and a discipline and, and um, prioritizing and investing in improvement, you know, um, it's, it's outstanding to see that. But what I'd say is, you know, sometimes when you focus um, so strongly on a kind of, you know, disciplined, deliberate approach to change, and so much of our effort goes into the, the change processes and following it through, you know, we can, we can swing the pendulum so far that we, li we, we lose some of our shared purpose. And I'd say, you know, the progress that has been made here is tremendous, but I think it's still fragile. And I think, you know, this whole thing about reconnecting, continuing to connect with our higher purpose, with our shared purpose, you know, building on our spiritual energy, I'd say, is, um, is, is really important. But um, I tell you what, I can't wait to come next time. So final point for me, I thought I'd end with another quote. And this comes from a guy called Dov Seedman um, from the USA. And to me, it kind of makes that point, you know. The last era of management, I think, in healthcare was about how much performance we could extract from people. The next is all about how much humanity we can inspire. And that's my challenge to you for the next two years. Thank you. <laughs>